And we are live. WrestleMania 40 is complete. Night two in the books at the Link, Lincoln Financial Stadium. I think that's what it's called. Lincoln Financial Field. Let's not get it wrong. I am John Pollock alongside Wei Ting, and it is only midnight. How did how how are you here already, dude? What's going on? You know what? I just needed I needed 24 hours. It was like I um, I got knocked out on Saturday night, and for the next 24 hours, figured out you know what? I'm gonna outsmart this stadium. And on Sunday night, it was John Pollock with a 10-8 round against wow. the Link. Okay, your traffic, get <laughs> out of here. How did I get out of there? Did I fly? Did I have a cape? No, I had a <laughs> I had a great. Uh, pal who gave us or gave me a ride home Amazing. and navigated traffic i really was just riding shotgun i had no uh contribution to the plan but um we're starting this like like almost like a full two hours earlier than we were yesterday this is amazing you wow. and i were um i i felt we had like good energy for the show i was dead when we were done and you and i finished we went to sleep around 4 30 i went to bed around 4 30 you god knows when you went to sleep because way just goes to town and we we're like, are we going to go to the Rocky Steps in the in the morning? Like, yeah, yeah, of course. That did not happen. Uh, Sunday morning, we woke up and it was uh, uh, like, dude, we. I, I think I everything crashed up. on us on Sunday morning. I don't. I didn't wake up until like noon, right before we had to go to um, uh, uh, Drinkers Pub, of course. Yes, um, it felt like an eternity ago. It does. Yeah. Um, today went by fairly quickly um, mm -hmm. overall. Let's talk about WrestleMania first, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about our day. We I, don't even have to talk. About I would it. like to talk about it. That was the I would say the highlight of the week for me was a Drinkers Pub. Uh, great turnout that we had. But um, wait, tell us about your night two experience at the Link. Yeah, I did not make it um, this tonight. What? Uh, yeah, no. What happened? I, I mean, I went. To, we went <laughs> as mentioned last night. I, I mean, it was kind of pointless. Um, I realized for me to go. And um, I, I wasn't really going to the press conference anyway. Um, and we would find out later, neither was John. Um, and I would essentially be at, in the press box watching on a screen. So why do I need to make that commute and the possible risk of having that two hour commute back to do the same thing I could do here? Or uh, what I ended up doing was uh, uh, going to um, Jordan Goodman's Airbnb, which really is Neil Flanagan's Airbnb. Um, thank you, although Neil. Neil was not here, but thank you, Neil, for providing the space for me to enjoy WrestleMania tonight. Yeah. So you were making, I thought, a wise choice, one that I was uh, envious of, but I did feel I I needed to go tonight because I feel that it was did want to be there live. Not that it was like make or break for that, but mm -hmm. I also felt like. In the event that I am on the list of uh, for the press conference, I should go. Um, I got there. It was the same setup as the night before. To my knowledge, it was like the same list. And like the way it is, listen, there's a ton of media that have applied. Some are granted access to the press conference. Others are not. That's just the way it is. And I was not on the list either night and not. It was really out of my control in, mm. in, in that sense. So would you say a lot more media this year than prior WrestleManias that we've been to? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I I had heard a number going around about the amount of media credentials and it sounded like like gigantic amounts were trying to get there. So it was it did feel like it was maybe the most media I've seen at a WWE show, which mm -hmm. is understandable. Understandable. So yeah. that was the that was just the setup. So I got there. Um it was different than the night before and you'll find this interesting way with the mm -hmm. setup. First of all, weather was so much better. So nice. It was that. really nice out. I actually and, ended up at the Rocky Steps. You did make it. Yeah, I did oh, make it. Yeah. Did you go up? I did go up. You of course. You know, I did take a photo. Oh, yes. man, I'm jealous. Yeah. Um, but we, we got there. So in the, in the media room, it's an enclosed glass area. But because of the weather... The glass was open tonight. Really? For they the can whole... open the glass. Yeah, I could see you wow. could you can see their doors that they they can extend it. Their That's windows. Cool. Um, so they opened it. It was cool. The problem was we have the monitors on and we're hearing. So when there were promos or when the bell rings, it's like you're just like the promos are just you're so, hearing so, two feeds at once. So there, so there's a delay between the audio in the room, which is the TV feed. And yeah, obviously what they're getting in the stadium. Yes. Yeah. So. It did a number on my match times because I'm hearing <laughs> the bell and it's like I have to coordinate it with like if I start my watch at the bell, the live <laughs> bell or the monitor bell. And then at the end, you hear the bell. And as well, like we're hearing the crowd react before 
the it was yeah. minor. It was just no, these, different these from are. the night prior. But overall, I would imagine that the people that went on night two, it was a like even as it got later into the night and a bit cooler, it was nothing like Saturday night. So okay. I think it was way better in terms of a live experience, I would imagine for me. That's great. That's wonderful. So um that that was about it from the live uh, side of things and I guess we can go into the show, and I'm looking forward to doing this because I have no idea what Way thought about this show. Mm -hmm. This is our preferred method where we don't talk to each other during a show. You have no yeah. idea. Yeah. We'll I might have thought this was the worst show in history. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll call it out there, you know. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just, you know, feed off of each other, um, and you have no idea what I'm going to say. Did you watch any of the pre-show? No, I did not. Okay, I did not either. So I didn't figure we were missing too much on the uh, the two-hour pre-show. But CM Punk makes his entrance and comes out to a gigantic reaction right at the tail end of the countdown show into the main show because Punk is going to be on commentary for the opener. And on night number one, we got the performance of... Um, the Star Spangled Banner. Mm -hmm. And on night two, we got God Bless America. And it's been pointed out the fact that like Vince McMahon, it was always America the Beautiful. That was his preferred song instead of the national anthem. And on two nights, we did not get America the Beautiful. And yeah. that would be a small thing. But if my biggest takeaway of this weekend, it was Vince McMahon is gone. Everything is the new era. They push that so hard. Um, and Everything was about like almost like this, this force has been lifted off of us and it's just like we are free. It's um, it was remarkable to see like how strong they pushed this. This was as much a rebranding effort as it was two nights of professional wrestling. Like that was to me the biggest um the most significant factor of these two nights was a public message about Vince McMahon being in the rearview mirror and he who shall shall not um, be named. But before we go to the matches, you know what? We're we're pulling out all the stops here on our final night in Philadelphia because joining us um, en route from the link, he is Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics, and we are joined by Brandon. Brandon, where are you? I am uh, right outside Lincoln Financial Field. I'm I'm walking towards uh, Citizens Bank Park. Is that what's called where the Phillies play? And I'm uh, hoping to avoid traffic to get an Uber. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay because I got out of that parking lot in about 20 minutes. And I I've been back at my Airbnb for like 45 minutes. And oh. we were on the air two hours earlier than last night. So I'm doing tremendous. Well, I'm glad to hear that you, you finished your journey. You finished your story uh, <laughs> much, much quicker than yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Well, my, uh, my, my story ended earlier on, on, on both nights than yours. Uh, you did just... Uh, exit the press conference where I was just telling way you might have heard, but I would say my biggest takeaway of these two nights, Brandon, was this was a this was a rebranding exercise for the company to the public. Vince McMahon is gone. All of that is in the past for us. It is the Paul Levesque era, and this is the new frontier for the company. And that is what these two nights were about from uh, crowning a new champion. It's a new look. It's a new signature. It's everything about the king is dead and all hail the legend Paul Levesque. Yeah, we, the, the biggest thing I think was you had the former chief brand officer, Stephanie McMahon, come out at the beginning of the night and... Uh, you can really read into her comments in terms of saying that she was there for every WrestleMania since WrestleMania won him, but she's proudest of this one. So you can really read it into, and we, we still don't know, right? What exactly led to her temporary leave, her coming back and then resigning as soon as Vince came back. We don't know, you know, what the relationship was with, with Stephanie and Vince. I assume there was some sort of rift there, but it does, does sound like there was some tension there and she's, glad to be back and I, yeah, I wonder if she couldn't come back for, for some reason and it opens up another question um, which I think was really encouraged by some of the comments that Paul Levesque made about okay is she was back as a, as a guest appearance here at Hall of Fame and on this night is she an executive again so mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a question a question that wasn't asked in the press conference by the way uh, nope. but that is a question yeah and can you just explain how Paul Levesque um like how he described Stephanie, because again, that was one of the questions I would have had going into this press conference. And I mean, I certainly took it from Paul Levesque that this was not 
Stephanie just doing a appearance. This like she is back home is how he characterized it. Right. He, he made one comment. He says he saw the doubt leave her. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's a new era. I'm prouder of this one than the others. And he saw the doubt leave her. Like, I don't know. Maybe you can just read that as, you know, she was, she was doubtful because she'd been gone for a while. Or maybe she was doubtful because there's some problems that, that she left because of that she had, you know, bad feelings about. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 it raises a lot of questions about what is her role in the company going to be? Is she just, did she just make a guest appearance or is there some permanent role for her to executive again? What were any of your um, kind of observations? Primarily, I think we'll focus on uh, Paul Levesque, what was said or, or maybe what was not said that you were most interested in hearing him speak about tonight. I, I would have asked him about the, the lawsuit. I was going to ask him something to the effect of, um, you know, concerning the Grant lawsuit, have you ever been aware of any inappropriate relationships involving Vince McMahon or any allegations of sexual misconduct in the company in general before the board of directors or the, the public generally knew about that? Um, but I think, so the, this was obviously, we should say, the gate was tremendous. And they haven't given a number, but they have said that this is the biggest, you know, last night's gate, which I assume is slightly lower than tonight's gate, just given probably the ticket demand and the tension that, that puts on, on uh, dynamic pricing. I imagine the gate for tonight, night two, is bigger than night one. And they said night one last night was the biggest gate that they have ever drawn, which mm-hmm. would therefore be more than $17.3 million and would be the biggest wrestling gate of all time. Adjusted for inflation is a different story. That's got to be like $22.4 million. Um, but we didn't get any number. Um, maybe there'll be a press release with some information, um, but he did say, you know, they broke merchandise records. They broke their sponsorship records. They both broke their social media records. No Peacock, no. Um, but maybe we'll get some more information tomorrow in a press release. Yeah, and also adding that their domestic gate record for Raw that they set last Monday will be broken this Monday with the show at the Wells Fargo Center on top of that. So, I mean, they were very much... Um, pushing like they're th- these gate records that they're breaking but yeah absent any specific numbers um th- that we have as well and i mean i i feel like that was kind of the most substance we got out of paul Levesque. like it was like tonight even more so than like night one i mean you you got some concrete information at least about brock lesnar like tonight very much felt like this was the victory lap press conference of man what an incredible two nights we got and we're patting ourselves on the back and that was you know supported by a lot of the questions that were in that direction i found yeah and he was deferent he, in the press conference he said that this is not just my era it's not just the paul Levesque era as, as as you john have noted ple now stands for paul Levesque era um but he was deferent in saying this is everybody's error, really emphasizing that it's a team effort. Um, but he, he even did, I think it's notable, he, he really praised Lee Fitting, who is now essentially in, in the role of Kevin Dunn uh, in terms of leading the production. And he really praised Lee Fitting and the changes that they've made to, to the television production and to the positive feed, feedback that they've gotten because of that. And he said that, that more changes are, are coming soon too. So. I, I thought that was notable. And Lee Fitting has only been around since January. We'll, uh, we won't keep you here too long here, Brandon, as you're uh, in, in uh, transit. But how would you state, like, if you are looking at this as a, as a PR exercise in all of the Janelle Grant lawsuit and what, like, this cloud that was put over the company, they have done, I would say, a very effective job in isolating this as a Vince McMahon problem and this company is moving forward without Vince McMahon, would you categorize it as how effective that has been on WWE's behalf and this weekend being like a really big public statement to the company of us moving on without him and we are leaving all those problems in the past that are all contained to Vince McMahon who is no longer attached to this company? Yeah, and I I think, you know, like we've had conversations. I think... I think it's been quite successful in that regard. This is, I think to most fans, this, this lawsuit and criticism about WWE's culture and the sexual misconduct allegations that are surrounding it, this, to the, to the general fan, they understand that, that Vince McMahon is involved. And then there's a lot of details that most people are not going into the weeds, for better or worse, to really grasp. Um, and I think that's, 
reflected in, in, the, in the questions that do get asked to, to follow that. Um, but I, I think the, the, the media questions are sort of a representation of what fans are aware of and what, what questions they feel like formulating. Um, but I would say, and, and not that I'm discouraged or you're discouraged to continue reporting on the issues that we've been reporting on, um, but I, I do think it's it's been quite effective. I mean, you can look at how how improved business has been from TV ratings to attendance to um, even you know mentions of Vince McMahon. The Rock dared dared to, to say his name and got booed for it. So it's that really sort of sort of sounds the alarm to me that oh yeah pe- people really do feel negatively about Vince McMahon and positively about Paul Levesque being in charge instead of creative. What, what did you feel, uh, Brandon, about um, an on-screen appearance from Bruce Pritchard at the end of the show? Uh, no, nothing much. I was a little surprised by it, but what did you, you think of it? I thought he was probably very genuine in his thoughts. Um, I... I guess I, I I wonder if any of it might have been um, any sort of retort to um, any of Ronda Rousey's recent comments, or maybe this completely existed on its own. Um, but I mean, overall, with this and also with Nick Khan being very public um, in, in the final closing shot of the show, I I felt like it was more of a, an announcement that um, these these are the members of the current regime that are responsible for the show that you are enjoying right now. And um, in some ways, they should be celebrated. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a good analysis. That, that I did catch that. I had I sitting there in the seats for the press conference and put on Peacock on my phone. And I would suggest, probably not a mistake, that you do all this stuff in the ring with all the talent and stars and everybody else streams out. And at the very end, in a kind of low-key way, but probably not an accident, you do have the WWE president so I give his congratulations and his stamp of approval to, to Cody as well. So, yeah, I do, I do think it's, it's sort of a subtle presentation of these are all the new people in the new regime here. We'll end it off on this, Brandon. Uh, you asked about Brock Lesnar on Saturday's press conference. Did your thought in terms of their handling of Brock Lesnar and the likelihood of Brock at some point being utilized again, did that change at all based off of Paul Levesque's answer that he gave you? I, I, I think he could have answered it in a way that made me feel more like Brock Lesnar was going to return sooner than later. Um, you know, we, we discussed it. If, if Brock Lesnar came out tonight, tomorrow night, and if it was, you know, in a, you know, a, a, a reasonably smart booked spot that he would get a positive reaction and for better or worse, I don't know that, fans are, are aware enough and thinking enough about what's alleged in that, in that lawsuit, uh, which is referring to him um, as being part of uh, this, this alleged sex trafficking scheme that Vince was uh, basically dangling to now grant a sexual encounter, which is now grant in front of Brock Lesnar in the midst of a con- contract renegotiation uh, with Brock. So I think... I don't think we're going to see him anytime soon. I'd be surprised, but but who knows? I think I would be surprised if we don't see Brock, Brock Lesnar, I guess, back in WWE at some point in the medium term. All right. Well, Brandon, uh, we wish you uh, safe travels home, and you're going to be doing a special Monday edition of WrestleNomics. Uh, when are you planning to go live on Monday, and are you coordinating it around the Eclipse? I am coordinating it around the Eclipse. <laughs> I think I'm going to do it right in the terminal in Buffalo as soon as I land, because I expect when I get back to Buffalo, the stream of tourists uh, that, that are arriving in Buffalo, I, I cannot confirm whether or not there is a site fee associated with the eclipse, whether the eclipse was, was paid <laughs> millions of dollars to come to Buffalo to uh, provide this economic impact. Uh, but I, I expect traffic is going to be really bad. So we hang out in the terminal in Buffalo and do a show at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. And it, it's a free one for everybody, whether you're a subscriber or not because it is the first show of the month. Okay, well, if WWE drops that uh, that Monday morning post-WrestleMania press release, I'm sure Brandon will be all on top of it for uh, WrestleNomics coming your way 4.30 Eastern. And uh, do yourself a favor, go on over to patreon.com slash WrestleNomics. And uh, Brandon, uh, it was great to uh, hang out with you throughout the weekend and and, and great work throughout uh, WrestleMania season. Yeah, fantastic. I'll see you at Money in the Bank.
Okay. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Take care, guys. All right. And on that note, we are going to flip back over to WrestleMania and we'll do an actual run through of the card. Uh, we left off mentioning the fact that we had a uh, God bless America from Warren treaty. And then in a similar start to night one, where it was Paul Levesque coming out and welcoming everyone to WrestleMania and kind of a big statement, you know, raw, raw speech. It was Stephanie McMahon brought out as we were just discussing. And she gave a brief speech about, being at WrestleMania one when she was eight years of age and has been involved in every single WrestleMania, which I thought was interesting language as here is the, the connective tissue from WrestleMania one to the present of a McMahon and kind of like, this is the McMahon mm. for lack of a better term of that binds our history together. This mm. is the McMahon that, unites all of these like the past era the current era and the future and stated that of all the wrestlemanias this is the most important because it's the start of the paul levesque era i mean this mm -hmm. was as clear as you could take what this was to be like this again like this was this was a marketing effort from the company uh this weekend when the most eyes would be on the product for its major show that vince mcmahon is a memory and one that we are not going to be remembering yeah and it was an effort that took place across three nights okay between uh the first instance on wwe hall of fame with paul Heyman giving his speech and according to paul Heyman, going against um the wishes of the person and you know basically uh providing center stage to paul Levesque but savvy enough to know what the what this exercise is like what this company has been building all of this towards with this weekend i also at this point really do have my doubts about whether or not it was going against the wishes or if it was directly playing into the wishes of the the, the regardless the, the it was a key takeaway from the speech i mean i i only say that because the rest of the evening the, sorry the rest of the weekend there was no shyness whatsoever about presenting paul levesque as this creative visionary for everything that we're supposed to be watching his voice is in the signature he wants all of us to know clearly that he is the person responsible the company wants us to know clearly that paul Beck is the person responsible for this show and and the creative um renaissance you know for lack of a better word that that we're enjoying right now um and it continued on night two with paul Beck delivering the opening address and it continued on night three with stephanie here um and it continued um at the end of night three with cody rhodes um directly bring paul Beck out for you know what in essence, to me, felt like a real more of a victory lap or at least, you know, th thank the maker um, for for giving me this moment. Yeah. And at the press conference, again, Paul Levesque stating that Stephanie McMahon is back home. She belongs here. And I mean, you certainly took that language and I wish it was just flat out asked of like Stephanie McMahon's involvement with the company and especially on an executive level that you would assume her to um assume uh based on a, a return to the company um that this was more than just an appearance and the fact that she was brought out here i i certainly think you were led in that direction and paul levesque's statements only enforce that idea yeah i mean we 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 can interpret it in several different ways um in, in, at the moment without really knowing for sure he could just simply be talking about stephanie being back on TV after maybe a long absence, uh, you know what, what, whatever confidence issues existed within Stephanie, apparent, you know, through public speaking, we we had no knowledge of it, nor any sort of suspicion that she was going through that. Uh, could be just something personal that you know they 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 were aware of. Um, but from the sounds of it, it sounds like she will be continued to be involved with the WWE in some capacity, if you know maybe even just at the very least being around in the back um more as a more constant presence so the show kicks off with seth rollins and drew mcintyre for the world heavyweight championship and we got two mega entrances beginning with drew mcintyre with this scottish pipe band that played him out to the ring really spectacular for drew mcintyre and Again, coming full circle from the WrestleMania 36 and being in the empty state, or empty warehouse, and here he's getting a an elaborate major entrance for this title match, and then that is followed by Seth Rollins with about 50 uh, rosebuds from the discarded Adam Rose entrance variety, uh, armed with banjos, accordions, and some of the most insane outfits um, that. 
somebody dreamed up. Um, but this was, I mean, this was spectacular. They, uh, Cole mentioned on commentary exactly what this was, and I, I'm sorry I didn't really get it, but it was some sort of a string band. And um, they further explained how um, in Philadelphia on New Year's, it's it's a tradition on somewhere. I'm butchering it, I'm sure, but there's some logic to this from what I could hear the commentators try to piece together themselves. I mean, it was cool. Like I saw them all setting up before they showed it on camera. I was like, oh, yeah. this is, this looks nuts. And it was nuts. So they come out and immediately drew hits the claymore. And based on this pace, I was like, these guys are not going 20, 25 minutes. They were um, just boom, going right into the thick of things. And I'm sure that will open up like a, like the thought process of, um, why this was the length it was or because this show was this was not a case of them having to cut for time this show was over well before last night's show was um they had the time to do it so um you know you did have rollins work a 45 minute match the, the night prior Dwayne was not on the show that was probably the difference well <laughs> well he was on the show yeah but he didn't get like the grand entrance and he was not involved directly in, in the match itself that was the key so drew hits the claymore and seth kicks out of it and then hits another but rollins rolls to the floor and the knee is chop blocked and then drew throws him around with these belly to bellies and again we have punk on commentary and he was the third member of this match because drew is constantly looking at punk trading words with punk and this allows him to get distracted and rollins rebounds with a pedigree on the floor and then connects with a stomp inside the ring drew's recovering and tries for another claymore but it runs into a powerbomb pedigree followed by the stomp and now drew is kicking out of this uh, the big moves and this was just your it's like you hit a big move, I'll hit a big move, and the audience was getting into the near falls from the get-go. There was a future shock DDT that Graves links to Punk's injury, and then Drew calls for the GTS, and Punk responds on commentary. That's not him calling for the GTS. That's him putting this crowd to sleep. And Rollins counters the GTS with a cradle, and Drew kicks out, hits another Claymore, and the audience bought this one, but Rollins kicks out, and Drew comes over and clears the desk, and Punk loudly on commentary says, he's clearing the desk because doubt is creeping into his mind because he needs to use this furniture. And Rollins bounces Drew's face into the desk and Rollins runs across the other desk, stomping Drew on the unforgivable table and rolls him into the ring. But in doing so, Drew sets up and lands another Claymore near fall. And then the final Claymore to keep Rollins down at 10 minutes and 35 seconds. They packed a lot into this in mm -hmm. 10 and a half minutes. And Drew McIntyre gets his big championship win in front of a full stadium. Seth Rollins was in tears after this, having uh, lost the title. And Drew... Now, he was in tears, and he mouthed something. And I was trying to read... I, I mean, um, I thought he had sent something like, uh, you deserve this or something to that effect. So, I mean, you can interpret the tears as him either being sad about the loss or sad or, or happy that um, a colleague finally got his moment. Or maybe he knew what was in store and he said, you deserve this. And uh, <laughs> okay. there is Drew sure. celebrate. And it's a... Yeah, good it, point. Yeah. It's like a mm -hmm. baby face celebration that Very Drew is so. having. Yep. But then he is sucked in by the negativity. Mm -hmm. There is Phil on commentary and Drew comes over and he's getting right in his face and Punk is just taking it and he puts the belt right in front of him and then he tells him, this is my moment and he holds the belt. He's like, get this shot. I want like my, I my glory it. shot to be you, you staring at my achievement and then he stands up and he gives the suck it signal. So Punk yanks his leg out from underneath him on the desk and Phil gets up and takes off the arm brace. The place is going nuts and he nails Drew with this arm brace and then Damian Priest music hits and he sprints his way down. Audience is going nuts and he cashes in, pinning Drew after the South of Heaven in all of 10 seconds and you had Judgment Day out to celebrate. Punk is laughing hysterically. Drew is furious. And the story is that Drew, the one who told Seth to keep his eye on the ball, didn't do it himself. And he let Punk t take his attention away and it cost him dearly. And there's a lesson there. If you put all of your attention on equaling uh, or settling a grudge with CM Punk and take your eye off of the ball, off of business, 
It can just set you off course. And you don't want to be consumed by CM Punk when you have your own stuff to take care of, your own business. Hmm. Yeah. Well, really deep layers to this whole that's, story. That's a, I yeah. thought this was excellent. And coming out of this, you have like uh, four guys vying for this title. You have Seth that will want his rematch. You will have Drew that wants his rematch with Damien and you have Punk once he's healthy to go. Hmm. Like these four can feud for months in either direction. You can throw Gunther into the mix on Raw or SmackDown. Um, anyway, just I, I just thought this was really, really well done and I, I love the cash in. Yeah, first of all, the match I thought was... Um... Uh, not really the style of match I was expecting. They, I was expecting like your big 2025. Yeah. They essentially went for like, you know, the, the Brock Lesnar and Goldberg type of like finisher spamming style, which I think worked so well for like heavyweights like that. I wasn't necessarily expecting it from a Seth Rollins match, but I thought it also worked really well. Now, I don't know if like they chose this style because they were limited to, to having a 10 minute match. Or if it was just the type of match that they really wanted to have anyway, um, because, you know, maybe, maybe it, was, it offered something maybe special. But I thought, um, for me, I was impressed that in 10 minutes they managed to create something so full. I almost feel like mm, there might have been another level they might have been able to get to with five extra minutes, especially if they were going to tell the story of, you know, an exhausted Drew cashing in afterwards but everything we're all going to mainly remember the post-match and i thought the post-match was handled brilliantly the 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 way that drew sold the moment as if he himself had finished this story that um he you know dating back to clash at the castle really dating back to the pandemic really really well told sort of um motivation for him of like having this elusive moment escape him finally getting it uh, treating it as a baby face, you know, tears in his eyes, even going as far as to going to the corner to hand the belt to his wife in almost at, at that point. I almost, missed that. Almost a parody of, you know, what Cody was going to do later on with with his loved one. The whole thing felt su like such a baby face moment and it worked perfectly because he lost it when his own hubris got the best of him and he saw CM Punk and just could not help himself but to rub this thing in his face and it ended up costing him. I think it's it, it was wonderful storytelling. Drew McIntyre has completed this current arc um, just wonderfully and this now losing the money, uh, losing to Damian Priest as a result of, of his own doing um, is is the perfect thing to take Drew McIntyre to the next chapter of this character's um, story. It's it, it's a brilliant way to build up to the next, again, next stage of Drew's um, char heel character. It's a great way to continue heating up the CM Punk feud, and it was a great way to crown Damian Priest. But we are also burying the lead. Yes, he won the title. Yes, there was a cash-in, but the man that has better utilized social media than anyone this year in a professional wrestling setting set a tweet to go out during this match oh. and there is drew in the midst of this battle with seth rollins and his twitter <laughs> right this tweet pops up from drew mcintyre's account at d mcintyre wwe bored at work lol and this is in the middle of the match and then several hours later he quote tweets his own tweet fuck what is bored at work means what he's just mean? he's in this match with Seth Rollins and it's not even a he's just so cocky in his oh, uh, efforts okay, during okay. this match but Got then it. not to be outdone was CM Punk who on his Instagram puts out the burial meme with his face plastered and it's Drew mm. that is getting uh, the, the one that is uh, being buried six feet under. So, I mean, some extra credit to this match for the social media component from Punk and Drew McIntyre on top of things. Mm, so I, I thought this was a pretty good start to the show overall and doing something very big and impactful. And here you have Damian Priest coming out that we thought as a, as a possibility, and I would say they kind of nailed this cash in. Mm. Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits against the Final Testament we are here, the Philadelphia street fight. After months of teases, proposals for matches, we're here. The six-man tag we've all tuned in for, and we are not just going with a standard match. No, we have a guest commentator. You know and love him from Dana White's looking for a, or, uh, for, uh, uh, not looking for Paris, a fight. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> for, um, 
What are you talking about? The Contender Series. That's what I'm trying to think of. Snoop Dogg was a alternate commentator for season one of a Contender Series. Anyway, uh, long story short. And then our guest referee, Bubba Ray Dudley. Yeah. This was was, uh, unexpected. Yeah. I mean, sure. You're in Philly. It's a street fight. I guess it needed a a, a guest ref. And uh, I mean, clearly they wanted somebody um, of an ECW attachment. And I mean, uh, uh, of everybody. Was Tommy Rich busy? (laughs) <laughs> of everybody uh who appeared in the hall of fame that i guess is within wwe sort of like ecw circle um i would personally say rob van dam might be the most popular one but rob van dam is also somebody who um is very attached to AEW on a, a sort of occasional basis bubba also kind of perfectly set up the table spot later on as well which yeah made made sense so cross and aop they're using kendo sticks early we had uh, weapon shots scarlet got involved using a kendo stick on lashley that set up bfab landing a pump kick and then scarlet puts them through a table going off the apron and <laughs> these two were like gone like for the rest of the match they're just dead on the floor Ford leaps over the corner post onto AOP. Very impressive looking uh, Topic on Hero over the corner. And then it's a DDT onto a chair by Cross. And Cross shoves Bubba and gets into it with him. So Bubba pulls out the Dudley glasses. This was not Bully Ray. This was full on Bubba Ray Dudley. And Cross turns and gets speared by Lashley. So the Prophets and Lashley do the was up spot. And then the get the tables that they do. Setting it up. Uh, unfortunately, one table did not want to cooperate because the legs gave out, so they had to reset a table. Ford hit from the heavens and Lashley pinned cross in eight minutes and 34 seconds. I mean, it was um, not great, not awful, but it was it was there. And they they used some bells and whistles with some cameos here. I couldn't really hear Snoop Dogg too well in where I was uh, on commentary, but um, Snoop Dogg is, is like... I would say almost always entertaining, no matter what he's doing. Like I, I remember um, one of the things that I, I saw of his recently was just him commenting on like gaming footage, and it, it was just like hilarious because he's Snoop Dogg, and I got the same vibe here. I don't think he really knew any of the participants. In it's this kind match. of the charm though of Snoop Dogg. Yeah, but it was just also like you know him like reacting to you know like a, a um, uh, whatever whatever he referred to a kendo uh, kendo stick as. Um, so honestly um at this point like i think it's (laughs) i think we can maybe wait a year for our like next snoop dog appearance i almost feel like he's he's getting a little bit overexposed in uh wwe usage for you you really enjoyed his entrance so last year yeah i know low rider i know but like getting it every year just it, it it doesn't really feel all that special anymore but obviously he had a product to promote here this was the reason why he was on commentary is because of his new gin and juice drink that was the sponsor of this particular match um but beyond that i thought for an eight minute match you know this was very successful in getting people to care about this match uh, for a few that nobody cared about he had, heading into this uh for eight minutes just using a whole lot of weapons and you know playing to the crowd's want for one of the most over acts in 2024 the table um they managed to create something that i felt was actually very entertaining and worthwhile in providing variety on this show for this crowd could it have used the sandman um yes i, I think this card maybe would have he should that. have been the the referee um i i wonder i wonder if um he was considered but bubba ray is, is arguably that much more well known to a wwe audience yeah they all posed in the ring including snoop and uh, bubba and then Kayla interviewed Paul Heyman to explain what bloodline rules are. Pretty self-explanatory. And LA Knight pulls up in the Slim Jim car. So that takes us to our third match of the show. Uh, LA Knight and AJ Styles, including AJ's new theme music. That, again, was was hard for me to make out. Did it leave any impression on you? Um, I uh, The only impression is that I, I don't think it's as good as this old one. But, I mean, change is good, for, especially when you're trying to turn a uh, heel. This was probably maybe a... Like you know, a change in character or a change in theme music and a change in pack packaging it was probably a long time coming because he's been a heel for a while now. Um, but it was fine, you know. I can't really say it made that big of an impression either way. Knight, uh, Knight is uh getting beaten down and then starts to bite AJ 
Styles res responds by raking the eyes, and then Knight leaps to the top, rotating him over with, with a German, dropping AJ on his chest as he flips over. Styles then connects with a sliding drop kick, going to the attack on LA Knight's knees, and then the floor gets exposed, and AJ back body drops Knight, who makes it back in before the count of 10, and a springboard 450 lands on the damaged knees of LA Knight, and AJ starts clutching his ribs after that one. They trade strikes, connects with a Pele kick, and then Knight ducks the a phenomenal forearm goes for the blunt force trauma and it gets stopped and styles tries for the styles clash which is which is blocked with up kicks pace intensifies for the final couple of minutes and a knight knocks styles off balance on the ropes as he's going for the springboard into the phenomenal forearm and the thwart leads to the blunt force trauma and the win in 12 minutes and 24 seconds I thought this match was fine, and I would say it it picked up at the like like nothing wrong with it. And the final couple of minutes, I think they got the audience more engaged. They were picking up the pace. It was a little just kind of, you know, just a lot of selling from LA Knight the first half. Um, fine match, nothing that I think at the end of the two nights is going to be you know um, jumping out at you as like a big match on either night yeah yeah for me um i i i would consider it a win for this particular feud if it managed to keep me captivated throughout and i thought it managed to do that it was a I don't know, relatively I don't know, simple match focused around knees uh knight's d injury um i thought there was at least some worry that knight has kind of felt like he's cooled off, you know, from what might have felt like his height several months back. And I, I had wondered if heading into this WrestleMania, if, you know, um, the worst thing that would have happened to him is if this crowd gave them gave the match a flat reaction or didn't react as much. They did not. This crowd was treating LA Knight like he was like a really, really important character. Um, they were saying, yeah, a whole lot. They were treating him like, you know, one of the more overacts, in my opinion, um, at, at least in the, on the babyface side of things. And I also felt like he was pretty impressive in ring as well. You know, pulled out like a really cool springboard tornado DDT. And then they closed off with like a really nice sequence of, of counters leading to the finish. So, no, it won't be a match that any of us might be talking about or remembering by the end of the weekend. But it was, I would still say, a good match on this show. And Knight comes out with a win. I mean, you could you could see him maybe being positioned on the brand that Damian Priest is. Uh, we didn't mention that Paul Levesque has stated the the next draft will be coming up in about a month or so. Um, so, I mean, it, it gives Knight the win and probably the end of this program. I don't I don't see much more that you have They to. might do a rematch at Backlash with the stipulation. They haven't done that yet. So it's possible it continues for a little bit. Maybe they'll put their homes on the line. Winner takes all property. Uh, winner has to stay overseas. And can't fly back. Okay. Passport on a pole. Yes. The loser loses their passport. Yes. I love it. Mm -hmm. They announce, or we should say confirm, because this had been uh, this had been out there, that the next Saudi Arabia show will be May 25th in Jeddah. And they're going to be doing the King and Queen of the Ring on that show. And they're also, for the first time, doing SmackDown the day before in Jeddah, as opposed to taping SmackDown the week prior. That's been the usual protocol mm -hmm. for Saudi Arabia. I would say the most noteworthy thing, and I'm curious how much if this came through on the broadcast, was when they showed the location, there were very notable boos. And that is something that we have seen like a lot more kind of indifference to the Saudi Arabia shows. They have become very normalized after a lot of backlash at the beginning, but mm -hmm. this was, it was very audible. Uh, it didn't come across to me on on air. Okay. Well, because I don't think they were feeding crowd audio mm. during this commercial, so it, uh, I didn't realize this until um seeing um some of the reaction on the internet or, or on Twitter. And I think you know that that's enough like publicity sometimes to, mm, you know, I it, it surprised me to be honest because I thought it, like it did for me too. Like I just I don't thought think WWE like crowds had just kind of been you know just accepting of yep. of this kind of being a regular thing um to the point where i didn't think an ad like this would elicit this sort of reaction um or do you think they're like i don't think for a second they're concerned with it no you know i don't i don't think so i think this was a reaction and i yeah like unless there is some like massive incident that forces them to um like they may continue to be somewhat, you know, careful about their on on air mentions for for Saudi, but like we saw with the last, like, uh, PLB. like they full. It, this is no longer like a it's not taboo, large scale yeah. international live event. It's like they 
they promote it. It's it's Jeddah, it's Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, and other sports are doing it too. So just in the public consciousness, I think there's more of an acceptance of it uh, and less discussion about like the issues that are still going on um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but, you know, for the WWE, this is a relationship that they are just only getting deeper into. And TKO as a whole too with UFC. Mm -hmm. The Hall of Fame roll call followed that, that Samantha Irvin uh, led by bringing the inductees on stage. You had Mike Rotunda and Barry Windham with Bray Wyatt t-shirts on. Mm -hmm. Jerry Briscoe was with Thunderbolt Patterson. Otta Johnson was there in place of her, her mother who has passed. And then Paul Heyman coming out to the ECW theme. Yeah. And uh, that was our introduction of the inductees for this year. Mm -hmm. Logan Paul, Kevin Owens, and Randy Orton for the United States Championship. Paul comes out in the giant prime monster truck with a prime bottle that shot like pyro out of it. I don't... Oh, yes, yes. You're not referring to the guy in the costume. No, yeah. no. Then th he was followed by the prime mascot that came out that has now come become a bit of a... Uh, um, a regular occurrence for Logan's big matches and everyone's automatically assuming this is going to be KSI, but I mean, you can pretty much put anyone in this thing and it's going to be some surprise. I don't just like it as a gimmick yeah, uh, because it, it always at least creates a little bit of a mystery within the match. You know, well, it, it, it teases that somebody's going to get involved and that there's going to be a reveal. Now, um, whether or not the reveal resonated to me, um, I, I, maybe I'll say right now it did not. I had no idea who this, I show, I show, I show speed. I show speed. I have no idea who that is, but I'm also a 40, I'm, I'm an XL years old man, uh, who does not watch those YouTube channels. I'm sure, um, for people who, who do watch, I show speed. This was probably a huge deal. You want to know the biggest stat about I show speed was that when he was born, Julia Hart was three years old. Wow. Okay. Okay. That, that makes him, um, very young then. Yes. Paul, uh, so Paul makes his way out with the mascot. Kevin Owens follows coming out and he's got the, the KO Mania shirt that he had on earlier this week. And he's got uh, like ECW inspired shorts. And um, so I guess every year at Mania, he's just going to uh, make, it'll be a, a, a nod to another promotion. We got PWG oh, yeah. last year, uh, ECW this year, and next, next year, year, AWA. There you go. Yeah. Vern Owens. I Something can't wait. tells me that uh, that might not sell, sell as well. As no, you don't think well. so. I don't know. I'm not so sure. You know, it depends on uh, whether or not I show speed is, uh, you know, keeping up with the uh, that demographic. Yeah. So he comes out, but then he walks to the back and he comes out in a golf cart. And, oh, I skipped over Owens. We got the, the long kind of uh, uh, trailing shot of Owens as he enters Gorilla and we get the reversal from night one where there is Sami Zayn with his newly won IC title and he's giving the uh, the final words to Kevin Owens. Mm. So a nice little, uh, you know, mm. uh, flip from the night prior. With the draft coming up, I wonder if, if you know, this might have been any sort of tease of these two eventually pairing back up again. Um, but I, I like these occasional nods, obviously, to their history. You kept them uh, separate long enough that this had some more impact uh, yeah. this time around. Mm -hmm. So he gets the golf cart, comes out, and then Randy makes his entrance. And Kevin Owens is at the bottom by the ringside. And then he puts it in reverse and he goes up the ramp. I would be nervous as hell yeah. backing this thing up on that ramp. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Jesus. But he gets up there. Randy gets onto the back of the cart, and they come down. This was the fastest Randy Orton has ever walked down a stage at WrestleMania in history. Yeah. I like that, um, you know, uh, uh, the Rock gets like a ring of fire in his logo. Uh, Logan Paul gets a truck. Um, ba Bailey got the boys. Uh, and, you know, uh, bagpipes uh, follow Drew, and, like, Randy Orton and Kevin Owens got – like a golf cart yeah that they could yeah, ride randy you've uh you missed last year's mania due to injury you were out almost a year and a half um this <laughs> yeah. is what we where we got cooking for i you. mean it was fun yes, yes so was. he comes out and then uh we start the match and we start off and it's like owens and orton working together and they're doing a lot of comedic stuff playing off of each other and all of a sudden it's like uh owens blocks uh, an rko and it's like orton's like oh i'm sorry i'm sorry and these guys they have very good interplay together. And then all of a sudden, Paul hits a double buckshot lariat to both of them. And then the crowd got into it by chanting Gatorade at Logan Paul. Then they were chanting like H2O, we want water. They were going through mm. whatever liquid they could. Other than Prime. Other than Prime, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So I love that the main sponsor is like the heel sponsor as well. But I mean, in totality, 
wouldn't you still say this was an incredibly effective campaign? I think it is. I, like, it's the way to do it. Yeah. The fact that I even know and we're talking about Prime and the next time I go to, to you know, a store and I'm looking for a drink, I might give this like, you know, ridiculous wrestling related product a, a shot. Like I'm not, I'm not personally, but I'm saying there are plenty of people that are watching this that may. Co and Cody endorses it. I mean, the man kisses the logo. Exactly. Exactly. Well, like, the whole point of any of this is to just get your product out there and to get people recognizing it. And they have been tremendously successful by, you know, utilizing Prime in this way, even without just the in-ring logo, just just simply being a part of the story. It's always tough when you have this setup where it's the heel with like two baby faces in a three way. And that's kind of how the match started. But then they just segued into a normal triple threat match where you had all the different interactions. And I thought they had some really well thought out sequences that, I mean, you had, you know, two solid pros here in Owens and Orton and Logan Paul, who is like great when you have that laid out match that this was and Paul and Orton get into a big uppercut battle. Orton then does the double draping DDT to both men. And then things pick up as Owens hits a fisherman to a fisherman buster to Paul off the turnbuckle. And then a top rope moonsault for a two count. Orton stops a stunner and lands an RKO uh, for a two count onto Owens. And then Paul brings out the brass knuckles and he shows up behind Orton. Orton ducks and then Paul blasts him with the knuckles. But Orton kicks out of the brass nuts when the audience was expecting that to be it and paul then nails owens with the knuckles on the edge and goes for another shot when the rko lands all three men are down and orton takes the brass nuts but instead of uses using them hands them to the ref and goes to set up the punt so is the paul levesque era going to feature encourage cte <laughs> and no instead the mascot saves logan paul and this is when Orton goes after the mascot and we get the reveal of I show speed in the mascot. And thankfully, uh, Pat McAfee was there. I mean, this guy is a pretty like well-known like YouTuber mm -hmm. and, and rapper and Orton attacks him, puts him on the desk and hits an RKO. The desk wins the exchange. And then Paul sends Orton into the post, misses a frog splash. And we get the finishing sequence with a pop-up power bomb by Owens onto Paul, then a stunner to Orton for a near fall. And then a pop-up into an RKO in midair by Orton. Paul gets rid of Orton, sending him into the post and finishes the match with a frog splash, pinning Kevin Owens in 17 minutes and 40 seconds. Some might feel this was a little on the long side, but I, I thought like overall, I enjoyed this match. I thought they had a lot of creative stuff. I thought that the use of I show speed was fun. It's Orton kind of injecting like his comedy side with like the serious side. And I think he has a great dynamic with Kevin Owens. I think if you don't have solid ideas for these two in a big singles capacity, you could do a lot worse than having a loose affiliation with these two beyond just this WrestleMania program that they had. I suppose so. Yeah, I, I'm not in love with with the pairing. Um, I, I'm I'm just kind of at this point waiting for the two of them to start feuding with each other so that Orton can move on to a Cody Rhodes feud. Um, something a bit more, you know, serious with with Randy Orton that I think would be more to my personal liking. Uh, but I thought this match was very successful in keeping this crowd very engaged and very uh, reactive throughout the entire duration. And I mean, I completely attribute that to, well, Randy Orton is beloved by everybody, but Logan Paul is is hated by everybody. So I think that that alone would, was a perfect combination. Now, I, I keep asking like whether whether or not I would have maybe gotten into more this in, uh, into this more if it was a singles match between those two. Um, that's another match that I think they can go to. Paul well. and Orton. Paul and Orton. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but certainly like having the dynamic of like, you know, Orton and um, Owens working together against Paul added something. Maybe I didn't love it because it's a two on one with two baby faces. But this crowd was engaged, and honestly, that's really all that matters. Um, in uh, I show speed, you know, I wonder how like the crowd uh, in, in attendance reacted to it. I imagine it might be similar to maybe our reactions to Paul Walter Hauser's reveal <laughs> at Supercard of Honor. Uh, but for the people at home, this was probably you know worth um, several uh, social media tweets, several thousand. That's the barometer. Million, yeah. So Logan Ball retains, and that takes us to the second to final match on the show. Io Sky defending the women's championship against Bailey. And we got uh, Bailey and the boys coming out yes, to start things out. What did you think about Bailey's entrance? Um, probably one of the special entrances 
maybe my least favorite. Um, I, I don't think we knew the significance of like what the eagle, sorry, what the uh, Egyptian motif meant to Bailey whatsoever. And I don't think the announcers did either. Even they were trying to piece together what, what the meaning of, of this was. And I think, um, <laughs> I think they eventually. Is this going to be one where it's like, we're, we're going to be <laughs> less complimentary on the entrance and then we're going to get a long Instagram post tomorrow and it'll be like, well, you, you guys, you guys didn't know what it, what it means. I when- mean, I, people can be free to maybe, um, I, I'm sure even Bailey herself would, would, would have explained it maybe even by now on, on social media, but I mean, this if, entrance was called Paramore was busy. If we were, um, confused, um, so were the announcers who were trying to piece together <laughs> like the clues as to why Bailey was going for this. And I think it was Graves who, um, keyed in on some sort of, sort of like Bailey being from San Jose and San Jose having some sort of park that was, um, uh, inspired in some way of of uh, something like this. I, it, it was this and the, the the Seth one that weren't immediately um, apparent uh, for their inspirations. And at least the Seth one to me was a lot more grand uh, with more people. Uh, Bailey was being lifted up by several men, and uh, I I just didn't think it was that spectacular. Yeah, I think we had a similar reaction. But I thought the match was really solid that mm, they had. Yeah. So Sky is working on the right knee, the previously injured knee of Bailey. She can't stand on it. She's great selling from Bailey. And Sky comes off the barricade and is turned into like a spine buster, I guess, kind of like a, a Bailey to belly in midair. And the crowd, it was, I'm sure this didn't make it onto the, the broadcast because it was faint, but it was like persistent throughout the match of the crowd that was singing for, for Bailey mm-hmm. uh, throughout the match, no matter if she was up or down sky gets in control for a while. And then Bailey gets a reprieve misses with the top rope elbow. And it's sky working for the cross face and goes to it several times before Bailey uh, escapes. And then you've got sky going to the STF and Bailey elbows her way out and finally hits a Bailey to belly generating a two count sky stops the rose plant on one occasion and then bailey's up and just slaps her in the face so sky slaps her back and there's a backbreaker from sky over the moonsault and bailey kicks out first big near fall and sky is shocked the crowd's chanting for bailey and she's doing the triple moonsaults off the turnbuckle but the last one off the top uh, misses as bailey rolls out of the way and sky does this awesome counter to the rose plant by flipping out and where i was (laughs) The people, they went nuts for this counter mm-hmm. of uh, out of the rose plant and really picks up here as Bailey lands this big lariat, struggles to her feet and hits the top rope elbow and then the rose plant to win in 14 minutes and 24 seconds. You and I have been very um, critical of the buildup for it. It just did not hit that, I think, emotional peak in terms of a, a story and feeling like one of the big matches going into mania but as we also noted was this is going to be judged on the match and i i thought they did an excellent job i thought this was um at worst the number two match on this show i thought that these two were i really got into this a lot and i and i thought they had a, a fair amount working against them because this I would say did not this was the opposite of gunther and sammy that sort of what short build but really built up and felt super important um but what did you think as a pure like just you know one-on-one wrestling match without maybe any sort of shenanigans i think i enjoyed this more than the main event and i think i enjoyed it uh more than even the opener uh just you know when we're talking strictly build a belt action with a clean finish i thought um this was the best i've seen eo in the wwe she was working so fast so aggressively and so precise in these very intricate like movements that she was uh, attempting and executing flawlessly, like that um, uh, counter to that rose plant, mm-hmm. um, that I I thought this was the best she had ever looked. And I mean, you understand, do you know, due to the context and the circumstance of this being WrestleMania, uh, the biggest match of her life, um, I think we can say, at least in terms of um, you know attendance, and also just the fact that she's about to lose the championship, you can understand why. I I I wish you know I have no idea what goes into a performance like this, but I I wish she could provide this sort of like intensity in all of her matches whether it be on tv or like you know future um uh pay-per-view matches if she manages to get on a pay-per-view the next time bailey i thought was tremendous at selling throughout and uh already emphasize you know the crowd wanting to see this title change and wanting to see her get that um crowning moment um very good match i thought you know and, and, a, and a big moment that they made feel important for bailey's career then we had the roll call. The, the celebrities were out way in full force. We had Michael Che 
George Kittle, T Pain was at WrestleMania, Vanessa Hudgens, and Lily Singh among them. And then Snoop Dogg makes his way out to announce the crowd of 72,755 and a two night total of 145,000. And he said 420. Yeah, but it was 298 um, on on the final three there. Yeah. But um, uh, Brandon Thurston was next to me, and uh, number one, his was like, "What was the gate?" And number two, was he caught the the 420 uh, yeah. Dis- yeah. disparity. So um, on top of things, there, um, I guess I'll be very curious because in some years they put out a press release on the Monday after, though it's not been consistent every year, and they used to. This was a while back. They used to hand us out a press release a physical copy in the the media box that night and it would have the work number but it had a legit gate figure and oh. they've gotten away from that a bit so, more but um, i'd be it's two nights of record gates i don't know why you wouldn't want to promote that fact um that you set your two biggest gate the two biggest gate records in the history of professional wrestling hmm. were set on these two nights so last time we did a wrestlemania was like five years ago but um there is at least maybe some hints of like so, so, some differences at least in in the way they handle that sort of communication with press um no handouts of, of things like that in years past they would actually have like um, they would occasionally bring like a legend through the press box to meet no, that's members right. of the press. Yeah, they, they would, would they would stuff. give you like D- a, DDP was in the press box, not not just, as like just hanging out, handshake. Yeah. You know, they would also um, unless I'm not aware of an outlet he was reporting on behalf of. He might. <laughs> well, he did appear at that press conference if you remember. He did. He did asking a question. I when I saw him up there, I thought he would be down there, if not in the ring for the end. Sure. But um, he was up in the press box for like the second half. But of the also show. in the past, they would like you know like uh, give things like um uh, shirts. Or, or like a um, like, like a tote bag with like a, a um uh, uh what do you call this program? Yeah, like a program yeah. or something. Yeah. So I mean, that that's all to say this felt like a maybe a different handling in a different regime that might be handling um all that stuff. Well, those were the attendance figures. We will probably get more uh, into the business of these shows in the uh, in the days, if not weeks, to come. But now it's time for the main event. And man, when I was looking at this watch, I'm like, even if they go an insane amount of time, this is not going to be as lengthy of a show as the night prior. It was it was paced fairly well. I would say they went a lot less on the video packages on night two than night one. That those they had some pretty elaborate video packages that, you know, the three, four minute pieces that add up uh, when most of the matches are attached to them. I also found, and maybe you had a different experience watching like the actual broadcast. Like obviously the um the advertising was prevalent. I didn't feel it was like the wallpaper effect mm-hmm. that I got on night one, where it just seems like any available real estate, let's plaster it. I felt it was a bit more subdued on night two than night one. Like you saw the dude wipes thing and it was on the post mm-hmm. as opposed to just blanketing it across. Right. They did have some of that. It just felt it was less than the night, the first night. And as Paul Levesque mentioned about, you know, we're trying out a lot of new things. I'm sure they're trying to strike like a happy medium of this new, this is new territory for them of introducing all of these ads and what is the healthy medium of like what is, what works versus what is too much or even distracting to the Mm -hmm. viewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there's maybe some of that, maybe adjustments between night one and night two that we're, we're not even necessarily aware of. I thought it was very notable how the main event did not have any Tuttle sponsor. Nothing. No, yeah. they kept it clean for now, the main event. Now, what you know, obviously they could could sell that match if they wanted to, probably even at a premium if they wanted to. Maybe American Home Shield was like, no, <laughs> we're we're here for the Rock. They chose not to, and um, does it you know give you some indication of restraint um, on uh, creatively on, on their behalf to not sell that space? Would have been a great question. Yeah, I would be right. curious about that. So. Roman Reigns is well look, Cody comes out first and he elevates from the the stage in this incredible looking mask that I can only imagine what the what the market price will be for this inevitable marketed mask. I don't think he'll be selling it. You don't think they're going to sell this mask? Oh, you mean this personal one? I don't think he'll be selling it. But uh, like replicas? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, maybe. I sure. The, you the could sell anything. Was wearing. And accompanied by Brandy that got a big reaction. Big reaction well. for Brandy. And that was teased, of course, from the Heyman uh, introduction as well. Well, but Cody had actually said on the MMA Hour this oh, week, Brandy, you will see Brandy. Okay. So it was somewhat expected. Um, but he comes out and then we had the All City Philadelphia Music Program orchestra and choir to perform roman reigns entrance and i thought this was really cool uh yeah 
I thought visually uh, both entrances looked really grand. Um, I mean, still though, if we're comparing best entrances throughout the week, um, I would still give the big edge to Jade Cargill, Naomi, and uh, 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 Bianca, Bianca Belair, uh, followed by The Rock uh, right underneath. Those two were my favorite entrances, but these two are also really, really strong as well, just given the context of everything. So we have, you know, big, big atmosphere for the match. This crowd is going insane from the second Cody is out and... Uh, we start the match, and early on, Cody pulls out a table, but Reigns puts it back underneath and got a ton of heat for that. Uh, the old reliable kendo stick making its way into another match, and Cody takes it away and misses in the corner, and things escalate as they fight into the crowd. Reigns gets suplexed onto a, a riser, and then they make their way back to the ring, and it's Reigns on offense until Cody manages a bunch of super kicks to Cody. He had a super kick party on Roman Reigns. And then we get the double clothesline spot. Both are up and Cody starts to fire up, including a bionic elbow. And he goes to clear the desk. This desk has been cleared out how many times over the course of two nights? I mean, they put all this stuff back together and woof, they just uh, clear it off. Reigns lands a low blow though and power bombs Cody through this desk, which does in fact break. Follows with a Superman punch and a spear, which gets stopped by a kick. And Cody responds with a Cody cutter for a two count. Cody stops a rock bottom and spears Reigns himself for a near fall and then goes for the crossroads. He hits one, goes for the second, but Jimmy Uso appears. And there was an aspect to this match that here we are 15 minutes in. And at least for me mentally, you know, with this bloodline rules, mm -hmm. this match ain't really going into gear until we yep. start to get the procession of run in. So at least when Jimmy appeared, it's like, okay, we're into the next phase yep. of the match where you can believe some of these near falls on a more significant level. Yeah. And I think that that sort of reaction, or at least that sort of thinking is dependent on maybe how aware you are of like the patterns of professional wrestling, because like I'll say I'll, plenty of people seem to like react loudly to um, the, the, the pedic, uh, what, what's, what was the move the, uh, uh Roman doing the crossroads and, you know, leading to that kick out. It wasn't a silent reaction. They were reacting big to spots like that. So Jimmy is out and super kicks Cody when Jay Uso's music plays and he comes out and they fight on the ramp, culminating in Jay spearing Jimmy off the ramp through a table. These two managed to have a better match on night two than night one. <laughs> something is somebody was making up for something. Yeah. It leads to a roll up from Cody as Reigns is distracted by all this chaos going on and he kicks out and Reigns comes off the ropes and lands the spear for a big two count. Cody then spears Reigns on the floor through a barricade and uh, you've got um, Michael Cole screaming, take that Roman, take that. The crowd's going nuts and he pulls him into the ring, two crossroads hit. And as he goes for the third, now Solo Sokoa enters and hits the Samoan spike and then lifts Reigns and puts him on top of a lifeless Cody. And Cody manages to kick out at two and they do the spear spike combo, which was a nice callback to mm -hmm. they were having so much success and the audience sees that as a viable finish. And Cody kicks out again. And that's when John Cena's music hits and he runs down to dispose of Solo Sokoa and hit Roman Reigns with an AA. And this is where we get the procession of cameos. So he, we already had began the procession of cameos. Well, I guess we're getting into the, the special, the special guest stars, okay? the yeah. ones that are going to have their own buses and uh, yeah. appearance fees. So he puts, uh, he hits Sokoa with an AA through the desk and the rocks music plays and they go nuts for the rocks music, but then they're connecting the dots that we're going to get the rock and John Cena yet another once in a lifetime moment between these two <laughs> yeah so yeah. they get into the ring they go face to face and it's a it's a cool moment they have leading to a rock bottom onto cena and then the shields music plays and i think this one caught everyone off guard mm -hmm. because it's seth rollins in his riot gear in his shield gear and he comes out and he's taken out by a superman punch and rock is standing tall with the weightlifting belt when the undertaker's gong goes off and Undertaker wasn't making that sprint down to the ring. He appears in the ring behind the rock and choke slams the rock. The lights go out again. The Undertaker has taken the rock into the depths of hell and we don't know where they've gone. I feel that he has taken the rock um, 
into pre-production for the smashing machine i think yeah. that's where the they get into 2000 and uh, the 1999 that's right yeah. that's right yeah. they're going back in back in time <laughs> to uh to the heyday of mark kerr so rock is gone taker's gone and reigns has a chair and hits rollins from behind the exact reversal of the turn Ten, almost 10 years ago exactly in june of 2014 with the shield turn and and almost like i think the idea was he had a chance of using the chair on cody but he couldn't help himself because of his hatred of rollins for this particular moment wanting to get revenge in this moment uh so much so that he it cost him ultimately it was a lot like the story with drew yep and mm -hmm. like and i'm sure they're going to lean into this like in the end rollins is going to have a stake in this title reign ending mm -hmm. um rain or i should say rollins did not do a whole lot here like he was no. out here to just get like kind of destroyed and yeah. it was it was an odd include like not so much that R you would want rollins to be involved obviously but so you know they uh, they will claim and they can claim that rollins was ultimately the, the one who delivered the final blow by simply being there and distracting roman enough through his their past together um that roman was distracted enough to lose the championship in the end i i would have liked to hear some explanation for why rollins decided to get into shield gear with shield music for this particular thing obviously it is to set up this particular moment reminding us of how Rollins turned on on Roman Reigns. Did Seth Rollins plan this out that deeply to say, I'm going to wear this so that he's going I'll to turn think my of the back time. on him? Yeah. So he's going to think of the time that, you know, I turned on him so that he'll d be distracted enough. I, I, I don't know, but th that psychology was at least a little bit, um, wasn't maybe as communicated, um, well enough on in this particular moment just yet. Yeah. Um, so he hits Rollins in the back and then, um, goes for the spear and again Cody kicks him in the face and it's one crossroads a second and a third crossroads and that leads to the win in 33 minutes 26 seconds Cody Rhodes wins the match I wish they had some catchy tagline though to attach to what this title signified but uh -huh. uh, nothing was coming to mind and then it was the post-match celebration where um the whole his family was brought into the ring they brought talent from the back Orton was out Owens was out. They had LA Knight. And then Cody uh, hands the title to his mom. A great moment. And then um, calls out Bruce Pritchard and Paul Levesque to come down to the ring. And he hugs both of them. Nick Khan was out as well. Like This was, hey, this is the guy for our new era and kind of the stamp on this is our company moving forward. And that was the conclusion of WrestleMania. You, got, was, you got your big payoff. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it was one of the big uh, WrestleMania babyface um, ce celebrations reminiscent of, uh, obviously, Bret Hart at the end of WrestleMania 10. Um, he, uh, Chris Benoit, WrestleMania 20, yep. uh, with Eddie Guerrero, and then um, Daniel Bryan, WrestleMania 30. Was it a similar scene? Did they lift him up on, on the... I mean, they had the whole um, anyway. confetti big celebration. Yeah. Yeah, babyface triumphant, but this one uh, almost especially maybe even more significant than all the rest, given that it was a two year build, a, a double sort of a, 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 a rematch of, of a prior exist, existing main event. This was also one that seemed to signify a lot more than just a baby face winning. This one was meant to signify the beginning of quote unquote, whatever new era that they're trying to promote, um, including a scene here with the maker himself, Triple H uh, getting thanked um, along with Bruce Pritchard. So um the, the the place exploded you know i mean they, the fact that i think um there was uh, this was a rematch gave people enough even a little hint of doubt that they could do the same thing last year um this year again and and i think that made for a real genuine um elation um by the end of this match that cody did actually win the championship um the match itself you know um Bell to bell, it was kind of your Roman Reigns match for a lot of it. Anytime Roman has the heat, it's a very slow moving match. Not that this crowd was quiet because they were so invested in the story that I think they were reacting to a lot. But as a viewing experience, when we're just talking about a match, it was not, um, you know, as satisfying as maybe the semi main event. Um, 
to me, the success of this match was going to hinge on the cameos and just all the shenanigans and how good and how surprising they ended up being. I love the Jey Uso, Jimmy Uso uh, interaction. As expected as it was, I thought um, I did not expect the big dive off the ramp through the, through the uh, uh, table. And um, Solo Sokoa leading to, to the John Cena appearance was also, I think, incredibly well done. Um, now, from that point on, Getting the rock in that moment with John Cena was also an incredibly cool, like surprise. Um, beyond that, getting Shield Seth Rollins maybe was a little bit unexpected and I think required a little bit of explanation. The Undertaker coming in to me was um it was a nice pop, but also one thematically that I don't think really worked at all. So well, the, the the two ideas throwing out is like it, if not Undertaker. Does Austin work in this role? Yeah. And I guess your positive is that it's a monster pop. I guess the question is Austin showing up, Austin and Rock getting that big, like in any way, does that overshadow or do you think that would have enhanced no. the moment? I think that enhances the moment. Now, okay. Let, let and it's say, also Austin. Like Austin just might not have been. So that to me felt like it, it my assumption is that um, this this made more sense for Steve Austin to be a part of, given that it's The Rock and they are just career rivals, mm -hmm. one and two. So Undertaker and The Rock have had matches, but you don't think of those two as rivals. So I just read this as, oh, Steve Austin didn't want to do it. I could be wrong. It did work. I like don't, don't you know, like lights off, Undertaker showing up and then taking The Rock to the depths of hell. Yes, it, it, it's cool. But Austin would have been so much like that much better. Beyond that, um, you know that would have been the best part of like the new era is announcing <laughs> we're no longer recognizing undertaker's losses at wrestlemania he's we're undefeated gonna, again gonna take those do, do you remember when they, when they did the goldberg streak and then they did sid replicating the streak where instead of beating guy all he had to do was choke slam guys and it would add a number to it so uh -huh. like they could have maybe just started the streak over here yeah brand new streak right undertaker now for, does for the choke slam streak at yeah, mania now yeah yeah but you know beyond like maybe having an undertaker or even a steve austin there Everybody who got involved in this match had something to do with the bloodline, you know, whether it be Seth Rollins, yep. Jey Uso, or um, LA Knight. Uh, LA Knight did not get. In oh, you mean like coming uh, out? He was the out there. Yeah. Well, I was just talking about the people interfering, okay. was, like including John Cena. These are all people who have yes. a vested interest in seeing the bloodline go down. And I, what does the Undertaker have, you know, against the bloodline? Um, you know, like, well, he lost to Reigns at a at a Mania. I mean, that's, <laughs> okay, that's well, the that's most I can give you. Pre bloodline, yeah. Um, isn't isn't Rikishi he, and BSK? You know, did they have a falling out? Yeah, maybe. He, um, yeah, maybe. Undertaker Whatever. Felt. The under it's the Undertaker. You got him at WrestleMania. People were were not upset unless you were expecting Steve Austin. Tune into his podcast and you'll find out all the all the juicy details. I so as we were like talking about like how you structure this and the, the likelihood of these cameos. Like part of it was, I thought, okay, that final shot, are you going to have sort of the, all the different stars, whether it's like Austin and Cena, but Cody's like the, like now Cody is the extension of these, these past mm -hmm. generational so stars. Mount Rushmore, but in that's person. it. Yeah. And I kind of like the way that the closing scene, you had the current talent and not so much the others that, I don't even think they would have overshadowed, but they did make a, they were cognizant of these are our stars today mm -hmm. that they left for the closing scene. You got to see Taker, you got to see Cena and you got to see rock, but they were not there at, at the end and didn't really need to be yeah. um, as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, all the baby faces come out, including a CM Punk, um, uh, including the, the Rhodes family negative one was there as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Brody jr. Was there as well. Uh, Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn, Brandy, yep. Randy Orton holding him, uh, and of course Paula Beck and Bruce Pritchard and Punk. Punk, we should mention was was yeah. all over this as well. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Cena was there. Oh, Cena was Cena there. Was there uh, yeah. Wow, I didn't even notice yeah. him, so I can't say he overshadowed anything. No, I I, and even if like Steve Austin were to show up, I don't think he would have overshadowed um, Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes was was the guy this weekend, and um, this was a moment that I think you know the entire yeah. wrestling world had been waiting for for two years. Um, so beyond that, uh, maybe the only notable thing was like there was specific sort of a focus from Cody Rhodes directed towards Seth Rollins as Rollins was limping out in his shield gear, almost seeming to indicate, I mean, obviously a big they thing. They traded words and Rollins kind of referenced the title as well. So yeah, you, you kind of had, yeah. 
So this might have been one of those, hey, you owe me types types of scenarios. And uh, it's like for what? Because you got hit in the back. <laughs> like, well, I don't, hey, I I don't put, know. It wasn't like the most. Uh, I had to drag my shield gear out. I had to get the rights to the, to the shield music. Maybe he's like, I took a I took a chair to my my fractured back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so that, that was. Uh, you, you got the big payoff moment it's going to be the memorable one i will say between the two i i thought the match last year was the better match of the two but this was the finish you wanted it was the symbolic you know changing of the guard and it was it was a big and it's going to be positioned as a historical match in company history the way they are gonna i think they're gonna look at this this is like their wrestlemania one all over again this is paul of wrestlemania one very much so yeah so we'll see how they follow up on it beginning tomorrow on Raw, and I'm a lot more excited for this Raw after Mania than I, I am for previous years. I think the luster of Raw after Mania had, to me has been a Dude, little Dude, last lost. year's was awful. It yeah. was the one where Vince was back, and it was like the just got – it was a terrible show. Yeah, um, and so tomorrow being the first – like tomorrow really is the season premiere. This is what you would consider a season finale, and tomorrow really is the season premiere where you might see a lot of new faces, the beginning of new storylines, new directions, and uh, surprise returns potentially. Could the ultimate symbol for the transition of this era to the new one yeah. have been the final moment? Cody's in the ring. He brings out Bruce Pritchard, who takes out his phone, deletes the contact. And uh, the, the avatar oh, wow. is no more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how how, how clear do we want to say? He's gone. That's yeah. it. WrestleMania 40, he's gone. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean... Yeah, there are a lot of ways. Maybe they, 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 I thought, I felt like they, they were able to successfully symbolize the um, evaporation and the defeat of Vince McMahon through this show. Yes. Okay, so that was WrestleMania 40 in the books, and I would say I, I, I definitely thought Night One was the superior show, but Night Two had the big moment that the whole, really, two years has been built around, but specifically the last year, it's all been geared towards this moment and you got it on the second night and i think people probably left these two shows pretty satisfied not just with the shows but where the company's going there's a lot mm. of optimism and i think you have a post wrestlemania period that doesn't feel like there's going to be this inevitable lull or this fall like it's they're doing incredible business it but i i think they'll have a nice wave coming out of this show they've set up a lot of different directions yeah i i feel like uh in totality i think the in ring i was less um into for either of this year's wrestlemania's compared to last year's maybe even the year prior um but this one delivered the conclusion of like the biggest story and and so much of wrestlemania to me is not just about the the result of the evening or even the quality of the shows of the evening it's my anticipation going into that year's WrestleMania. And for this year's WrestleMania, you can argue, um, I think it was one of, it was probably the most anticipated in, in a decade, maybe even beyond for some people, maybe of all time for some people. And I think that deserves to be applauded just for the way they managed to create this bloodline of, you know, uh, Dwayne Johnson, Cody Rhodes, Seth Rollins story. Um, they've done a great, they did a great job with uh, uh, Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre as well. And they paid those things off in a satisfying way for everybody. I thought um, the Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre, uh, Damian Priest conclusion was was really well done. Um, Bailey and Io, to some people, might have even delivered match of the night. And I think that says a whole lot about just maybe a lack of interest heading into that feud. So they had that to, you know, maybe celebrate. Um, Gunther and Sammy was also a major highlight this weekend as well. I would say between the the two nights of Mania specific, that that was my match of either night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's yeah. go through and Sammy. Um, we can take some super chats if we have any, and then um, we will. Uh, uh, dude, we are talking. It was a ha we we're a half hour before we started last night. I know. I'm in a great mood right are now. Are you in a mood? Do you do you want to take some feedback from the post wrestling forum then afterwards? Uh, we 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 can do a little bit. Let's not go crazy okay, here. I okay. mean, I'm uh, I'm not I'm not trying to break our record. For hey, uh, I I uh, speaking of records, I, I do think we are uh, enjoying a brand new attendance record here for one of our live streams at YouTube.com/slash Post Wrestling 420 or, or uh, at oh. uh, uh, at Post Wrestling on Twitter and also on Facebook. So do us all a favor if you're uh, following us on any any of those sources, please share our shows, share our podcasts. We're available on Apple Podcasts. Um, 
Google. Oh, sorry. I don't even think that, think that exists. Spotify, subscribe, leave us a nice review, uh, or uh, simply like the video, subscribe to us on the YouTube channel. We are still a relatively small, believe it or not, podcast source. Uh, so any, any of your support is helpful, including your super chats from those of you who really want to support us um, by sending a, a message in here. Uh, Anthony Scats sends $5 to say, thank you, Anthony, first of all, for that support. He says, being there live, I adored Seth's entrance. Jason Kelsey, who was there last night, did a Super Bowl parade speech dressed as one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I was seeing some of the chat room um, chatter about uh, just confirmation that it is a Philly thing. And um, the specifics, I will leave others to um, clarify. But thank you very much, Anthony. Let's go to Robbie Olson, who says AJ versus LA should have been a Punjabi prison made out of Slim Jims. No, you know what? The Bollywood boys have taken ownership of the Punjabi prison this weekend. And they they I haven't seen the match, but dude, they killed themselves in, in this match. And uh the fact that GCW invested in uh bamboo of that magnitude, I mean, I hope they get multiple uses out of this, but uh it sounded like the Bollywood boys they just uh um destroyed themselves in, in in this match it seemed like quite the violent affair uh so yes we did have our uh wrestlemania uh listener meetup today and um reporting of course is uh john pine who um did not make it to the show but i actually i spoke to other uh people who watched the match and this actually is definitely going to be on my to watch list you know once i recover from wrestlemania weekend because yeah. this really did seem to stand out in terms of just um a different level of violence and spots and Maybe even creativity, I should say. And I was also informed that the Bollywood boys had to catch a flight just hours after this yeah. match. So full of uh, blood and whatever else, uh, you know, dripping from their systems. The Bollywood, uh, sorry, the Punjabi prison match from the cluster. They got to go through customs, man. Like that's that's not like I just know. any travel for for an American. That's right. Yeah. We go to Robert, uh, J. Robert Frick, who sends $10 to say, great coverage this weekend, boys. Shut up, Burnus. Okay, Burnus. Shut up, Burnus. You're the Whoever man. Burnus is. You're, uh, uh, thank you. Jer Jared Black sends a $3 Australian super chat to say, Samantha Urban is an incredible asset to WWE. Did you see her call of Cody winning? Yes, yes. And we did not mention it, but it deserves to be mentioned. Um, rarely do I think like we, I don't know, do announcers really kind of stand out? And oftentimes maybe announcer standing out is not a good thing. But man, Samantha Urban like she doesn't overshadow any of the announcers she only like or, or uh, wrestlers she only enhances them in like the best way including her call of the Cody Rhodes win tonight where her voice was cracking and um clearly emotional and it was not a perfect announcement by any means but it was the it was perfect they showed like they put the video up and it's like she is crying as yeah. she is announcing this i thought it was incredible it, like i had no um like I, I get it was very hard for us to like hear where we were uh situated but just watching it it was like i thought like that's it was like a memorable the, call the words were clearly difficult for her to get out because she was feeling i think a feeling that so many people watching were were going through at the same time um it was really the perfect way to announce and completely real so completely agreed samantha urban is a great asset um let's do a few pieces of feedback why don't you uh read them as i've all right let's go to forum.postwrestling.com this is of course where all of our post wrestling cafe patrons can leave feedback after all of our major shows we didn't really have time to do it last night but we do have a bit of energy and time to do it so let's go to curtis from the 519 who says as someone who doesn't normally tune into WWE, I tuned in tonight to watch the main event from beginning to end. Outside of the random Undertaker appearance, I thought it was an incredible, it was incredible theater, drama, and action. A hot crowd, great belt, belt to belt action. Commentary was amazing. It was everything that made me fall in love with wrestling originally. Cody feels like the biggest star in the entire industry, and I thought it was an amazing performance by all involved. Absolutely insane to me that WWE originally weren't even going to do the match in Mania this year. There was no other way to end WrestleMania this year, and it's wild that they even considered doing anything else. Uh, yeah, so this is a, it, it's a, um, the entire story of this WrestleMania is maybe just as interesting as like, you know, the result of the show itself. And I'm very curious to see how they present it on Wednesday on that behind the, behind the stage, behind the curtain behind special. The curtain. Yeah. On YouTube. So maybe John and I will do a, like a little bonus review of that at, at some point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jeremy in Texas, WrestleMania will always be about moments. And tonight had to have been one of the top moments in WrestleMania history. Was it an overbooked mess? Absolutely. Would you say over? 
I, I didn't feel that. I mean, it wasn't, it was a lot, but I think they kind of set the table that that was almost the expectation that, hmm. um, if, th like, instead of this be like, this was a bloodline rules match, but it wasn't as though this is going to be a hardcore match, no blood, but it was instead, it was the numbers game that, and you had again, the, the, the Avengers. Yeah. I think at the end of the event last year, we had all pictured in the rematch Cody versus Roman Reigns one on one in this time, much like, you know, the prior match Cody um, would wrestle the entire match by himself and he would earn the victory by himself. Um, I think the moment they announced bloodline rules, we all knew what, what that meant, or at least like uh, John and I did. And I'm sure a lot of other people. So I was expecting a procession of cameos like almost as if it was sort of like a curtain call for a lot of the characters that had previously appeared within these storylines um i don't really get too upset at at the overbooking because um cliche as it sounds wrestlemania is about creating moments and by giving you surprises and i i thought they provided that with those cameos let's go to trigger happy who says two takeaways uh the new era is here and it's awesome the biggest heel of the night was the guy in the crowd with the big head signs Okay, great. Cody from Maine, I only followed along with the show on Twitter. Okay, so you didn't watch the show. Um, was the year delay worth? Okay, so he's asking about delaying Cody's win by a year. Um, uh, look at the business. The answer is yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you could certainly argue last year, like, would they have gone through this big period with a new champion and Cody? Like, perhaps, but I, I can't look at it as... It was not a negative. There was no way to paint it as that. And you got another year out of this Reigns title reign and... Business was great for them, and that's in the midst of some horrible coverage for the company that, I mean, ultimately, a really solid in-ring product has, you know, uh, however you want to take that, has overshadowed real-life events that could have been detrimental to this company from a fan perception standpoint. Yeah. They have weathered that storm, and the audience has not lost um, yeah. support of this company. And let's not get it wrong. Like, it was a major risk to do what they did and we can even debate whether or not like it was uh, like what was the decision behind you know not having cody win last year was did they have any intent of actually going to the rematch this year or was it just the whims of you know vince or whomever who decided roman and it almost really wasn't well? going to be that match this year exactly so was this ever a grand plan you know like or or did they just happen to Fall, uh, did did all the pieces happen to fall in place to present the opportunity? A lot of things could have happened. Cody could have gotten injured. You know, uh, Roman could have gotten injured. They could have like you know would have had to sure. just discard everything. For whatever reason, everything worked out perfectly into this um, cohesive two year story. Um, so we can all at least say right now it was definitely. And you know, again, I, and I keep landing. going back to this point about these two nights, like a hu the huge theme of this being our launching off point. This was the title switch you want to do on this show. Like this yeah. wouldn't have had the same statement with a Reigns Rock main event on mm -hmm. night two for the purposes of this um, promotion that they wanted to give to the public of yeah. this is the new company and this is our guy. This was the the result and the night to do it with Cody. We also have a few more super chats here. I'm sorry I didn't get to earlier. Alex Ramirez sends two bucks. Thank you to say, I love you guys. Don't watch the WWE, but watch y'all. Very, very good choice. Thank well, you. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. And we go to Jay Boba28, who sends five bucks. Thank you, Jay Boba. Uh, Jay Boba says, it's great mania. I know it's too soon, but do you guys think Gunther will dethrone Cody at Bash at Berlin? Um, I think it's too early to... I think the worst idea you can have is putting a championship on someone with an end date in mind. They had that with Daniel Bryan before he got uh, injured. Um they also had it with superstar Billy Graham. Like the day he won, they knew when he was losing it. And you could state like superstar Billy Graham caught fire. And was it time to take the title off him? I would say no, it was not. And in this one, I think Cody, like you, you have to be able to look at like what, what happens now with the post mania business. And I think it's going to be very strong with Cody that I wouldn't be just, okay, well, we're doing a show here and time to move on to Gunther. I think Gunther is a big opponent for Cody. I would, I almost don't want to see him just shifted into the the first post mania program. I mm -hmm. think he needs to be a big one, and uh, the timing would work for that to be the big match at the end of August. Yeah, yeah. So, what would you do with Gunther in between time or or with at that match show? at Berlin? I think you could have the match, but it like it it doesn't have to be Gunther winning the title. Like he could he could 
he could lose there. Like he's probably going to be the big baby face there, which which is not a bad thing for that that night on the idea against that, Cody or against somebody else. Against Cody, I think he I think he would be the baby face. No, yeah, I, I'm saying, would you even do that match when you know you also have Damian Priest now with the championship? Um, I, I I I or would you do a rematch with like either Sami Zayn or um somebody else? I see them doing the rematch with Sami Zayn a lot sooner. Mm, like as okay. soon as like the France show, I, I could see Zayn doing a match in Montreal, and I think in France you could do the rematch with with Gunther, maybe. Uh, and that is it here. Thank you guys uh, for all of your feedback. Sorry we couldn't get to everybody in the forum, but uh, we do have a, a little bit of a curfew here as we have a flight to catch in only a few hours. Yes. Uh, thanks to everyone that came out to Drinkers Pub on Sunday. We, um, you know, really it was Davey that kind of took the bull by the mm -hmm. horns and planned this whole thing. So a big thank you to Davey. And we were just like... We were just going to go all hang out, like the Poison Rana crew, us. And it was like, if anyone shows up, bonus. And a ton of you showed up. It was so awesome to meet so many of you that had come uh, from Europe, like all over the place. People that are not specifically for us, but traveling to WrestleMania weekend yeah. uh, from all these different countries. And just hearing stories about how people have found our show. And, um, you know, we got a gift. We got a branding iron from a uh, from one dicky bird that he won at the the lapsed fan show that was going on a terry funk branding iron yes. that you're somehow uh, or brandon is somehow going to take across the border for you brayden is oh brayden i'm sorry yes yes, yes yes so um yeah thanks to everybody that showed up and yeah that's gonna conclude uh, our and, and a huge thank you to uh andrew thompson um on, on the website really manning it and jack went on helping out as well uh giving us incredible coverage of everything that's been going on the website has looked amazing mm -hmm. and for it to happen with John and I here and and not really um uh, being able to contribute for, like as much as as usual uh is a testament to Andrew Thompson the yik himself Jack Wanon John Pine sending plenty of uh, GCW reports uh busting his ass typing these reports on the phone as he's attending eight <laughs> shows uh throughout this the course of this weekend so thank you all to to everybody who contributed Karen Peterson for New Japan reports on the website as well uh, and also John Ceno, WH Park, Rich Fan, giving uh, us audio from uh, WrestleMania weekend. And nearly their lives. Uh, that too, yeah. Uh, so a lot of bonus coverage from the weekend covering uh, DDT, GCW, Bloodsport. Um, uh, what else we got? Um, uh, the, the House of Glory show, uh, Stardom. Um, and of course, Ring of Honor, Supercard of Honor, Spring Break, Spring Break that you you and I uh, are, are at least um, Supercard, which you and I went to see uh, and, and did a bonus show on. That's all in the Post Wrestling Cafe. Uh, special thank you to everybody who, of course, signed up to for this week and uh, decided to you know check out some of those shows. Yeah, want to thank all of the the people that jumped on the cafe or our. Uh, members uh, throughout the year it's it's that support that keeps post wrestling running it allows us to do things like this where we get to go and cover things in person and that's uh that's it that is the the fuel behind mm -hmm. uh the site so thanks to everyone we will be back in toronto on monday and somehow we will be back monday night following a three-hour edition of raw with rewind to raw so tune in minutes after raw on the post youtube channel and that concludes our wrestlemania 40 coverage